Welcome to Bambra, a small but spectacular village on the Northumberland coast that was once a capital of the historic Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria. Home to a small population of around 400 people today, this picturesque village is a popular spot for day trippers and sightseers, as Bambra boasts some of the most riveting landmarks in England's northeast, from the enormous Bambra Castle, which stands on top of an extinct volcano, to this, one of the oldest churches in northeast England. This is St Aidan's Church, which was built in the late 12th century. However, this more than 800-year-old church isn't the first to have stood here. About 1400 years ago, in 635 AD, a small wooden church was built here, and became the site of a significant development in England's religious history. The original church was built by St Aidan himself, the founder of the nearby Lindisfarne Priory, and an Irish monk and missionary who brought Christianity to North East England. In 651 AD, Aidan died here, and his body was taken to be buried on the holy island of Lindisfarne, which lies off the coast roughly five miles away from here. But within the churchyard of St Aidan's, we find a monument to another figure famously associated with the village of Bambra. This memorial features an effigy of Grace Darling, a veritable national hero of her day. Born here in Bambra in 1815, Grace Darling was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper who worked on the Farne Islands, just off the coast from here. Coming from a humble background, her memorial is now one of Bambra's most famous landmarks, and there's even a museum dedicated to her just across the road from here. But why exactly did Grace Darling become so notable? Well, to understand, we need to take a look at exactly where in England this village is located. As you can see from this map, Bambra lies on the North Northumberland coast, in a very isolated part of England's most sparsely populated county. During the winter months, the coast here is notoriously perilous, with the cold, violent waves of the North Sea having claimed many lives over the centuries. And it was among a violent storm in 1838 that Grace Darling rose to fame as a national hero. In the early hours of the 7th of September that year, Grace Darling was keeping watch out to sea from her family's lighthouse, looking for any ships that may have been approaching amid the tempest. Through the lashing rain, she spotted the wreck of the ship Forfarshire, which had been split in two while its survivors were clinging to a tiny rock among the rampaging waves. She alerted her father, with whom she set out on a small rowboat toward the survivors. Braving a potential fate at the bottom of the ocean beneath them, Grace Darling and her father heroically saved at least nine survivors from the Forfarshire, and the story soon hit national headlines. Darling, aged just 22 at the time, was awarded a medal for her bravery, as was her father too. Grace Darling died just four years later at the age of 26, but her legacy remains one of the great stories to come out of Bambra, and as we mentioned, you can discover even more about her at the RNLI's Grace Darling Museum here. For now though, we find ourselves in the very centre of Bambra, a very small settlement of around 400 permanent residents today, and which is only made up of these few small streets. Behind the beautiful pink trees on this street, there stands a large wall which surrounds a pleasant shop and garden. The wall actually dates back to the 17th century, and is built with bricks that were originally intended to be used as the ballast for a ship, but found their way into the structure of the wall. Opposite the wall is the Grove, a triangular-shaped tree-covered area that sits in the centre of Bambra, and was once the site of the local quarry, in which sandstone used to build Bambra Castle was mined. We'll get a look at the spectacular Bambra Castle, which has dominated the village's skyline for centuries, later on. But here we find one of the liveliest points in Bambra on a sunny day like today, Front Street. 
Despite there only being a permanent population of around 400 people here in Bambra, Front Street shows just how popular Bambra is with visitors, seeking the serenity and sights of this beautiful village. At the top of Front Street here, we see the Victoria Hotel, with the flags of England and of Northumberland fluttering outside. The Victoria is the largest hotel in Bambra, featuring 29 rooms for guests to stay in, a bar and a brasserie, all of which make it one of the village's most popular spots to sit back and relax. The Victoria Hotel was built in the late 19th century, roughly the same time as the vast majority of its neighbours that line the busy front street here. The boom in building at the time came about as the village emerged as a popular seaside resort, famed for its wide open beach that stretches as far as the eye can see along the coast here. As you can see in the village centre, tourism remains at the heart of Bambra's local economy, with Front Street home to a row of pubs, restaurants and gift shops that cater to visitors. But you'll also find a number of traditional shops that permanent residents of the village use, along with the pubs that are likely rather quieter in winter. One of those is the Castle Inn, of course named after the castle that stands on the edge of the village. Once a particularly small tavern, the Castle Inn has expanded over time, though it retains a beautiful, traditional interior, complete with wooden beams and two old fireplaces. Plus, for a sunny day like today, there's a nice terrace and garden out the back. Continuing along Front Street now, in the distance we can see Bambra Castle as it towers over the village. Along with the quaint shops and cottages, and the lovely greenery that you'll find on Front Street, the views of the castle make this road one of the most eye-catching to walk along in England, possibly even one of the country's most beautiful high streets. It's no surprise then, that almost 50% of visitors once rated Bambra as their favourite attraction in Northumberland, and in 2021, the village was named as the best seaside destination in the UK. With its five-star beach and beautiful, riveting heritage, all serving to entice anyone who passes nearby. But if you are passing through Northumberland, how exactly do you get to Bambra? As we mentioned, the village is located in a fairly isolated area of the county. More specifically, within the Northumberland coast area of outstanding natural beauty. Bambra can be easily accessed by cars turning off the A1 road, but as for public transport, your only option is the bus, with a couple of coastal routes stopping in the village by St Aidan's Church and down by the castle. Here we now find ourselves at the bottom of the grove, where there stands a small village fountain and a pair of benches in between the road, offering a stunning view of the castle ahead. But before we get down to Bambra Castle, Let's not forget that not all of the buildings on Front Street date from the late 19th century, the period when the Victoria Hotel was built. Some houses are even older, these single-storey houses built in the 1800s. Of course, Bambra's history goes back much, much further than just the last couple of centuries, but the 19th century saw the biggest change in the village, with the building of inns to cater to the growing tourist trade. We mentioned that the village developed as a popular seaside resort in the late Victorian period, an era when holidays to the beach were becoming all the rage right across the country. However, larger scale tourism like what exists in Bambridge today came about in the first decade of the 20th century, with the village growing in size before the First World War. Over the road, we can see some of the cottages that were built in the 1900s, the road that runs between the cottages is the Winding, a newer lane that was laid out in the last century and is now home to a number of holiday cottages. The development of Bambra in the modern era owes itself to two men, Lord Crewe and Lord Armstrong, whose names you'll still see in the village. Here we're walking past the Lord Crewe Hotel, a 17th century building that's actually one of the oldest on Front Street. The hotel bears the name of Lord Crewe, the former Bishop of Durham, and a landowner in Bambra whose charitable trust contributed to the growth of the village. The charity was founded in 1721, 
the year of his death, and it has been a part of a number of development projects in the northeast of England. This included the commissioning of the world's first lifeboat on the River Tyne, the building of the harbour in what was then North Sunderland, now the nearby village of Sea Houses, and a number of charitable facilities in Bamburgh. Lord Crewe's trust brought much change to the village, but the biggest change in Bamburgh's recent history came in 1894, when Bamburgh Castle was sold to one Lord Armstrong. Armstrong was a wealthy industrialist, and he was responsible for overseeing the construction of much of the stunning Bamburgh Castle as we see it today. While the castle has hundreds and hundreds of years of history, the fortress that we see today dates mostly from the 19th century, when it was restored from a decaying state by Lord Armstrong. The Armstrong family took up residence in the castle, and still own and live inside it to this day, making Bamburgh Castle one of the few living castles that still exist in England. But while the castle is still inhabited, you can visit and tour its incredible interior. And we'll get a brief look at that as we now make our way up onto the extinct volcano on top of which a fortress has stood for over 1600 years, and which went on to serve as the capital of the Kingdom of Northumbria. As we step onto the pristine Castle Green, the first fort to stand over Bamburgh was built in the year 420 AD, constructed by native Britonic tribes in the area. A little over a century later, in 547 AD, that small fort was captured by the forces of the Anglian king Ida of Bernicia. With the capture, Ida established Bamburgh as the capital of his kingdom of Bernicia, and he ruled from this point for 12 years until his death. But what exactly was Bernicia? Well, the early medieval kingdom was a short-lived territory that encompassed part of northeast England and southeast Scotland. The independent kingdom of Bernicia came to an end in 654 AD, when it unified with the fellow Anglian kingdom of Deira to the south. Their unification gave birth to the great kingdom of Northumbria, which had two capitals, Bamburgh, that of the old Bernicia, and York, that of Deira. For two centuries, Bamburgh and York remained the co-capitals of Northumbria so named for its location north of the Humber estuary. But in the 9th century, the kingdom was split in two, a story which we'll pick up in a few moments. Here underneath the Grand Castle, however, we find Bamburgh's eye-catching war memorial, placed here in 1921 in a small recess carved from the base of the castle. Despite being hidden underneath the castle, the memorial had become eroded and weathered, but was recently replaced to its current shining state. But looking up as Bambra Castle towers dramatically over us, we must remember that the fortress was built on top of a volcanic outcrop, although you won't see much lava flowing by today. For one, there are, rather thankfully, no active volcanoes anywhere in the UK today but the black rocks that we can see up above do have a volcanic history stretching centuries, millennia back, and serve as some of the most striking volcanic rocks to be seen in the northeast of England. The outcrop here is part of a wider regional deposit of volcanic rock, which is believed to have formed about 295 million years ago, give or take a few weeks. With this imposing outcrop having existed even before the dinosaurs came to dominate the Earth, the 1600-year history of Bamburgh Castle seems rather puny. But let's return to the story of the castle, and of the village's status as the co-capital of Northumbria. As we mentioned, Bamburgh and York were the northern and southern capitals of Northumbria for about 200 years, until Viking invasions of the 9th century saw the capture of Northumbria's southern region. Famously, York became Jorvik, the capital of Viking England, while Bamburgh was left as the de facto capital of what remained of Northumbria. The castle here 
then remained a royal seat and the most politically significant point in the kingdom until 993 AD, when the Vikings arrived and destroyed the fort that stood here in Bamburgh. But following their invasion of England in 1066, the Normans came and rebuilt Bamburgh Castle, beginning the structure that stands to this day. Though none of the Norman work remains in the castle, its oldest feature is the innermost castle keep, which dates back to 1164. And while the fortress is today a grand residence and a popular tourist attraction, in the medieval era it found itself at the centre of a number of conflicts. In 1346, Bamburgh Castle was where the Scottish King David II was held prisoner by England. Meanwhile, in 1464, during the Wars of the Roses, the castle was the site of a first in English history. Held by the Lancastrians under the later King Henry VI, the castle was the first English fortress to be defeated by artillery after a powerful Yorkist onslaught. Over time, there was less and less conflict around Bamburgh Castle, but the fortress, overlooking the sea from high on up, has always remained strategically significant. In the Napoleonic Wars and the Second World War, the castle was fortified with coastal defences, as Britain feared that either Napoleon or the Nazis could have launched an amphibious invasion of the country by landing on Bamburgh's wide open beach. Neither invasion ever arrived in Bamburgh, however, and the beach, from which you can also get a stunning view of the castle here, is now a five-star expanse of sand stretching along the coast, and a popular spot for people to sit back and enjoy the sun and sea. Now standing on top of the extinct volcano with views for miles around, we're coming to the end of our walk in Bamburgh. But before we finish up, let's briefly walk through the Battery Gate, an impressive restoration of what was once an imposing 12th century gatehouse. The restored gate is just one example of how Lord Armstrong and his descendants have sponsored the upkeep of this historic castle, one of the most famous landmarks in all of modern day Northumberland. Note that Northumberland, the county in which Bamburgh is located today, is different to the historic kingdom of Northumbria, which the village was once capital of. And with that cleared up, we've now come to the end of our walk in Bamburgh one of my favourite villages in England. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that you're now itching to visit beautiful Bamburgh for yourself sometime soon.